AM 1240 and 95.3 FM, WJON. It's another edition of Health Matters brought to you by Rejuve Medical. My guest today is Dr. Joel Baumgartner from Rejuve Medical. Joel, thanks for joining me today. Hey, Jay, my pleasure. Good to be here. All right, so we're talking today about arthritis. Okay, very good topic, and things do change. I know we've done topics on, you know, we've had conversations about this before, but treatments and and how we handle it, it certainly changes over time. Tell me about uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly in regards to arthritis. Yeah, well, arthritis, you know, I don't think there's a ton of good. There's there's definitely some good treatment. There's it's not always good news when you go someplace and they take an X-ray and the doctor comes in and says, "Well, what do you know? You have arthritis." For most people, it's kind of a, you know, a, oh boy, I've got a chronic problem. It's going to be forever. And it's always, you know, kind of a little bit of, you know, bad news. But uh, the good news is, you know, we've come a long ways. There's a lot of kind of neat things we can do to help arthritis. And there's also, you know, we're finding there's a lot of things we should avoid uh, when we have arthritis as well. So when someone thinks they have arthritis, what are what are some of the feelings, uh, the the symptoms that they're going to have? Yeah, typically, you know, arthritis sets in. It can set in at any age, but typically it's going to be something that's going to be happening after age 30, 35. You know, it's analogous to wear and tear of our tires. You go get some new Michelins. They've got nice treads. It's really thick. You know, it's going to last you five years. Same thing with our joints. Our joints are coated with a cartilage, which is kind of like the rubber on your tires, which is, you know, kind of thick and gives you some cushion for a few years. And as we age, we're going to eventually wear down some of that cartilage. So it's inevitable. All of us will develop what we call osteo or wear and tear type arthritis over time. And it's just really a thinning of that cartilage. And uh, what they might feel would be, you know, a little bit of achiness in that joint, uh, might be a little stiff. And as it progresses, they might actually start losing some range of motion in there. They might notice some swelling around the joint. Um, in their history, they might have a history of maybe some falls, a trauma. It might be a high school athlete that maybe sprained their ankle or their knee that kind of set them up for years and years of slow degeneration. So if you're experiencing some of those symptoms, is it good just to go in and, and get tested to find out whether or not it's arthritis or something else? Yeah. You know, arthritis is kind of a, I'd say, a general term, right? So there's a lot of things that can cause swelling in a joint. You know, living in central Minnesota, a pretty common cause would be, you know, Lyme disease can cause swelling in your joint too. So um, when you get swelling in a joint, the differential diagnosis is relatively broad. You know, it could be an infectious process like Lyme disease. It could be an infection that's spread from someplace else to the body and settled in the knee. You could have kind of an inflammatory process going on, like rheumatoid arthritis, which is a little bit different than what we're talking about today. We're kind of talking about that average wear and tear arthritis that we all get just from using our bodies. But we have a sore joint. You want to rule out some of those other, you know, diagnoses that may be treated a little bit different than your standard osteoarthritis. You, you mentioned that there's this, you know, once you get past 30, there's a possibility for that. Are there some risk factors, some things that you might have done to your body that would lead you more likely to get to arthritis? Yeah, you know, there's a few factors. I mean, part of it is genetics. You know, we kind of tend to inherit, uh, you know, what our parents went through. So a lot of patients will come in and they'll say, oh, my, my dad had a joint replacement at age, you know, 60. And uh, so you do inherit kind of the quality of our cartilage, the body habitus, uh, the way our bones kind of angulate together. <clears throat> but some common risk factors, maybe things that we could empower ourselves to avoid, would be the first one would be just that, you know, what, what are you carrying for an extra load? Again, back to a car analogy, it'd be kind of like if you, you're driving a pickup and you load it back up with, you know, 1,000 pounds of bricks, those back tires are probably going to wear out a little bit faster, you know, than if you unloaded those bricks when you have less load. So definitely, you know, practicing a healthy lifestyle, getting your body down to an ideal body weight, you know, all the research and studies do conclude that weight gain increases wear of our joints and our back, our spine, and, and stuff as well. But the cool thing is it also shows, the research shows that if you lose weight, decreases your risk of joint replacement, decreases your risk of chronic back pain. So the first thing there is looking at the, at the body habitus. The other risk factor is just, you know, in, an injury. You know, for example, a high school player who sprained his MCL at his knee, he's probably at about, you know, up, you know two or three times greater risk of having arthritis down the road because what happens when we sprain a joint is it causes just a little bit of micro-instability. It means that joint feels pretty good for about 10 years, but it's just a little bit off because that chronic sprain there, and then it starts to wear out. You know, it's like having a loose tire. If the tire's kind of wobbling all the time, that, uh, that joint's going to wear down a little bit more. So definitely a sprain be a risk factor. Actually, one of the most common, and actually the number one risk factors for males and females is uh, – is loss of hormone support. So once a female goes through menopause around age 50, 
Foods is the supporter for estrogen progesterone, which is directly related to bone health and bone density. Her risk of arthritis and wear of her joints goes up just from losing her hormones. So, you know, here we do a lot of what's called functional medicine, which is trying to get those hormones back in a natural way to a healthier level, which can really help preserve the joints, but it has a lot of other positive benefits as well. You're talking about the risk factors, and uh, that is interesting that uh, when you were discussing those towards the end of the segment, um, you were talking about how um, someone uh, could get arthritis, um, you know, if they end up being overweight. Um, is your diet have any impact on, you know, whether or not you're susceptible to getting arthritis? You know, as much the diet per se, and there are some details maybe to talk about with that question. You know, the unhealthy inflammatory type of foods can definitely cause any area of our body that are kind of achy or inflamed to kind of be a little bit more inflamed. You know, so some of those things might be a lot of the processed grains and breads and sugars and you know, healthy uh, or a high percentage of our population, you know, probably about 30 plus percent, you know, may not have a true gluten um, allergy or sensitivity, but they don't tolerate gluten well. And gluten is basically kind of a protein found in our different grains. So there's a lot of gluten in bread. So breads and, and, and grains in general can be a little bit inflammatory to a you know, relatively high percentage of the population. Um, so that means if you kind of have a joint or a, a back that's vulnerable eating those inflammatory foods could flare it up a little bit. Grains, uh, and some people have really, you know, specific food sensitivities. So, for example, myself, I've got a sensitivity to, to strawberries, which was kind of different, uh, broccoli, cauliflower. So sometimes things that we think are healthy for us, our body actually can mount a little bit of an inflammatory response towards some of those foods. So what I usually tell patients or people, I say, you know, if you feel like, you know, you're eating food and you can't really tell that you're getting bloated afterwards or, you know, changes in your stool, there could be something that you're eating that your body is kind of mounting a little bit of an inflammatory response towards. Now, it's not a true allergy. An allergy means you're getting itchy, you're swelling, you're having an allergic reaction. A sensitivity means your body doesn't tolerate it well and has a hard time digesting it. So sometimes getting like a food sensitivity test can help people make wise decisions based on, you know, their genetics and their, their food tolerance is what they can eat that's going to be maybe less inflammatory to their body. If you crack your knuckles, are you uh, more likely to get mm -hmm. arthritis? Yeah, my son cracks his knuckles all the time. That's a good question. I, I always tell him to stop it, mostly because it's just kind of annoying. It just, you know, it, it just sounds bad. But, yeah, there's not really a lot of evidence that when you, when you crack your knuckles, your body's just releasing actually just a little bit of gas there from the, from the crack. It probably is not going to increase your risk of arthritis, unless you do it excessively to the point that you're creating a little bit of laxity in your knuckle. If you're, you know, cranking it all the time and it's creating some looseness, that looseness is kind of analogous to a sprain, and a sprain can increase your risk. So just a little pop, as long as you're not cranking on it too hard, it's not too bad. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, going back to what you were talking about with that chronic knee injury, where someone who was in high school, they sprained a knee or ankle, whatever it happens to be, is there anything preventative you can do once you know, okay, I've got this bad knee, what can I do to try to keep myself from getting arthritis? Yeah, the best thing you can do in that, that kind of a situation is, again, keeping yourself on an ideal body weight, knowing, okay, I'm going to be somewhat vulnerable. Uh, number two, when injuries occur, is making sure you're getting good rehab. You know, a lot of people, and I myself in college, had a really bad ankle spray. I was playing volleyball, jumped, came down, my foot went under the net and landed on someone else's ankle and just rolled it terrible. But back then, you know, you're kind of naive. You just think, oh, it's just an ankle sprain. And it, it, it swelled. I could barely walk for a month. So obviously I had a pretty substantial ligament injury. So what happened is I didn't rehab it. I didn't really do any treatment. So the problem there is you're kind of left with a, a gimpier ankle because you didn't rehab it appropriately right away. So you know, usually at least when you have kind of an injury that's causing you to limp or gimp and it's throwing off your gait and you're getting a little bit of weak and ball around that area, it's good to rehab those things right away uh, just to prevent more long-term injuries. Um, certain injuries, if it's a really bad ligament sprain, you should be a little bit immobilized for a while just to allow that ligament to have you know more optimal healing. Um, and then in general, you know, say you're in your 40s and you have a little bit of wear and tear, it's kind of mild, just kind of get achy. There's actually quite a bit of research out there in different supplements that have been shown to be helpful for arthritis, and especially in that mild to moderate category. And some of the new ones that have been researched a lot lately is turmeric. Uh, you've probably heard of turmeric. It's just kind of a spice. You can go out for some uh, good uh, Thai or Indian food. They cook a lot with, uh, with uh, turmeric, which kind of makes everything kind of that yellow. It's the same thing that's in mustard. So a lot of mustard will give you quite a bit of turmeric. But turmeric is more of a, a natural anti-inflammatory, um, but does not have negative side effects. 
Um, another one, just to throw another good one out there, would be collagen. The bovine or you know um, animal-based collagen, it comes in a powdered form of capsule. That actually has been shown on MRI studies to actually thicken the cartilage a little bit, which is what we want because arthritis is thinning of the cartilage. So of the arthritis that we're talking about today, if uh, someone is living in cold weather climates like we do here in Minnesota, mm -hmm. uh, are you more vulnerable to arthritis because of the cold or is that a contributing factor at all? You know, it's not going to make your arthritis um, flare up or excuse me, it's not going to increase your risk of arthritis, but it can definitely cause you to feel more stiff, and uh, people in colder environments may have a little bit more achiness. Uh, one thing for sure is affected uh, is barometric pressure changes. So, like, you know, we have some fronts coming through here, getting some thunderstorms, or the barometric pressure is changing. Often people with arthritis will do a little bit more achy that day um, just because of the pressure changes. Okay. I wanted to at least give a, a couple of segments here to talk about treatments because those things change so frequently. Uh, tell me, what can you do for someone who is suffering from arthritis? Yeah, you know, people are coming in, I see this every day, you know, five or six patients coming in with knee pain or knee arthritis, and uh, they're very concerned, and they want to, most of the patients I see, they're very um, proactive, they want to engage, be a partner in their health care, and um, my philosophy is really, you know, try not to do a lot of cover-ups, try not to do anything that's going to be harmful, you know, give them good advice based on good sound research and something that's going to do good for them, so the first thing I actually always talk about is, you know, what should I avoid if I have arthritis? Because, you know, there's a lot of things that we do on a daily basis that we might not even know could actually be harmful to or to our joints and, and have some negative consequences. And kind of the first one that I kind of talk about are our NSAIDs, or a non anti-inflammatory medication, which would be like a lead, naproxen, ibuprofen, you know, how those common grabbing goes when you're kind of at the checkout counter. Um, and the problem with those guys is they have, billions of dollars in their marketing campaign. So they show these people walking around and you know, they can't play with the grandkids. They pop their leave and then they're, you know, doing cartwheels and back handsprings and they feel amazing. So you see that commercial, you think, well, I want to do a cartwheel and a back handspring. The problem is if you look at the research on NSAIDs, this includes the whole category of drugs, like we talked about, the uh, Aleve and the proxy ibuprofen, is those drugs when taken over the counter actually increase the risk of a joint replacement by two times. That's like, well, how could that happen? They're anti-inflammatory. Can't that, isn't that a good thing? Well, you know, inflammation is, is kind of a hot topic. Inflammation, if there's too much of it, you know, can cause pain and swelling. But the body uses its immune system. The immune system is inflammation. It's, it's cells and it's, it's platelets and it's stem cells. The body uses those to try to repair. So you have that ankle sprain back in high school, right? So your mom's like, well, why don't you just pop some ibuprofen? Let's get you back in the game. Well, all the studies are showing that those that pop the ibuprofen have delayed healing of the ligaments, and the ligaments don't heal to the potential they could if you didn't take the ibuprofen. And like I referenced, the study on arthritis is those that are taking over-the-counter medications for arthritis do have a two-times increase of the joint replacement. So in general, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories or prescription anti-inflammatories really don't do anything healthy for the cartilage. They, in fact, will increase the risk of you know, problems down the road. Now, the problem with them, they are actually a pretty good pain medication. They do block the pain, but there's other things you can do to block the pain that might be healthier. And then also that, like the turmeric that I referenced, the turmeric is a natural anti-inflammatory that has been shown to help with pain and a little bit of the pathologic inflammation, but does not block that healing process. So I definitely go down that route. The other big take-home is, you know, we go to the doctor, you've got some joint pain, they say, oh, you've got tendonitis, you've got arthritis. The first thing they recommend after the ibuprofen is they recommend getting a cortisone shot. Now, cortisone has been studied very extensively, and it's been confirmed over you know, multiple studies that it's actually detrimental to cartilage. So, again, with arthritis, we've talked about what it is. It's thinning of the cartilage. When you put cortisone into a joint or a tendon, it actually causes atrophy and breakdown of the cells. It actually kills the cells. It's called chondrotoxicity. It's toxic to cartilage. And so when you put cortisone into a joint, it actually breaks down the cartilage. So... Despite giving you a week of you know, mild pain relief, you pay the price because two months down the road, your arthritis is going to degenerate farther. So if um, you're thinking about doing something, I would definitely avoid cortisone shots into the joints or spine because of all the research now showing more negative side effects. Boy, it sounds you like know, these, these are short-term you know, things that are, are going to work against you long-term. Um, have we have we learned something? It's, it sounds like uh, you certainly have learned that it's better for those that are suffering from arthritis to to try to come up with more of a long term solution as to uh, as opposed to some of these just get you back in the game approaches. Right. 
Yeah, the majority of my patients, you know, when they come to see me, they don't want the quick fix. You know, they don't want to, you know, just have pain relief for a week because they've been dealing with this for a, a while. And so we kind of get in the conversation, well, what can we do more long term? You know, and, and with arthritis, you know, there, there's definitely a few different options. You can do what's right. You can start practicing a healthy lifestyle. Like you said, just losing 20 pounds is going to decrease your pain by 20%. Um, decreasing some of those inflammatory foods, you know, doing the right supplementation. Um, and then it comes down to what can I do, uh, you know, different procedures. So the majority of patients, you know, they have mild to moderate arthritis. They've gone to the, the orthopedics and they say, well, you know, we could do some cortisone. And the, the patients now are getting more educated. They say, well, you know, I don't really want the cortisone. And they say, well, you know, when the pain's bad enough, let me know we can replace your joint. And so most patients aren't really happy with that answer because they don't necessarily want to go down that pathway at that point. So then we talk about other options that can be done in the joint that don't have harmful effects. You know, one real simple one is there's some natural lubricants you can inject covered by most insurances. They're called hyaluronic acid injections. No negative side effects. They actually uh, hydrate the cartilage and can almost like you're greasing a rusty hinge. You kind of grease the joint up and the joint feels pretty decent. So that's actually approved for, for knees. After that, there's uh, different types of what I would call regenerative type procedures, um, which would be like PRP or stem cells or even prolotherapy. The neat thing about you know, anything from prolotherapy to stem cells is the amount of what we call level one evidence, and that's the top tiered evidence showing that it's actually beneficial for arthritis. Um, prolotherapy is, is real simple. It's a simple dextrose-based solution, which is a sugar compound. When injected in the joint, so it actually decreases pain, increases longevity of the joint, uh, improves uh, quality of life. So there's a lot of research there, tons of level one studies. PRP and stem cells are a little bit newer, kids on the block, and those are biologics that actually have been shown to improve cartilage quality, turn back the clock, and decrease pain and improve function in those joints. So it's definitely some good options. Tell me about when you have a, someone in there and they're looking for, like you said, the long-term fix. They're not looking for the short-term fix anymore. How do you determine yeah. which is best for that person? Well, you know, a lot of it, I kind of do a candidacy uh, rating on them, and a lot of it's based on the amount of degeneration and the amount of arthritis they have, you know, whether it's mild, moderate, or more severe. Um, we all take it, also take into account, you know, is it the spine? Is it a peripheral joint? Um, and then we just have a conversation with the patient and kind of decide on which, which option of those three is really best for them. Uh, and, you know, sometimes they'll start, for me, they're, they're basically like different, um, you can grab a different, you know, size gun. If you're going to go shoot an elephant, you might need something a little bit larger. If you're going to go shoot a turkey, you might need something smaller. So if it's something kind of mild, you know, to moderate, we might start with what's called prolotherapy. And prolotherapy is just basically concentrated dextrose. It's shot into the joint, the ligaments, the tendons, the muscles around the, the joint that support it. And what it does is it's actually a mild irritant. So it kind of sounds weird. You're injecting an irritant into my joint. But what it does is when it goes into the joint or ligament, the, the, the dextro solution um, irritates the area just slightly so the body mounts, again, that inflammatory response that we talked about before. And, again, a little bit of inflammation is good. That's the body trying to repair itself. So what happens when the body thinks there's an injury in that knee or that ligament and that, or that tendon, and it'll go back and we'll start to repair it on its own. So what you're doing there with the, with the uh, prolotherapy, you're kind of faking the body out. You're saying, hey, this place is injured. Go back and repair it. So the body mounts a little swelling, and it sends its own platelets and stem cells, and it starts the repair process. So that's kind of prolotherapy. So PRP is kind of a step up from that. PRP is a biologic, so it requires a blood draw. So we know in our blood we have things like platelets and stem cells and circulating growth factors that really are aiding the body every day and trying to heal itself. So we've all cut our fingers, right? What happens is the finger bleeds, and within a week it's everything's closed up and the skin has grown over and it's healed. How did it do that? Well, the bleeding, you know, brought platelets to the area. The platelets stuck to the area. The platelets kind of formed the scab and eventually created new skin. You know, the same concept happens when we sprain our ankle. We, we actually sprain, and that's a tear of a, of a, of a ligament. When a ligament is torn, it causes localized bleeding, which causes the release of platelets and more stem cells, and the body goes and repairs it. So what we're doing with PRP, platelet-rich plasma, is we're just doing a simple blood draw. We take out the platelets, and then we inject those platelets, which are our catalysts, our healing cells for healing, and we inject those into the tendon, the ligament, the joint, the muscle tear, and it causes the body to repair. So we're just actually being more specific and delivering those healing cells right to the source of the problem. So the last one is the stem cells. That would be the bigger gun. So the stem cells have the most potential to heal, the most potential to repair, 
the most potential to bring back a rotator cuff tear, a meniscal tear. So we use the stem cells usually with larger rotator cuff tears, meniscal tears, or when you have arthritis that's considered more moderate to severe. Uh, Stem cells have a little bit more ability to kind of stick to the cartilage and thicken that cartilage based on the research done by MRI. So um, stem cells would be the, the bigger gun for more severe, and if something's kind of mild, maybe you'd start with the prolotherapy or the PRP. If someone were to have these procedures done, um, how invasive are they, one? And then the second part of it is, will they have to have that procedure done at another point in their life? So they are, they're just done via uh, injection and guided by ultrasound or fluoroscopy. So that means they are, we use imaging so that we can visualize the tissue that is degenerating. So with an ultrasound, for example, I can see a rotator cuff tear. I can deliver with a small needle those solutions, whether it's the PRP or the stem cell, right into that tear. So it's very accurate. Um, I can deliver it and I can kind of recoat the joint, whether it's the hip or the knee. So you can be very accurate with these image-guided injections and place the, the biologic tissue, you know, you know PRP or stem cells, right to the area of degeneration. So... If you've ever had a shot in the joint, it's very similar to that, except it's a little bit more specific with the guidance of the uh, ultrasound or the fluoroscopy. And then you'd also, like, for example, in a knee, you want to recode the cartilage that's breaking down, but you also need to inject the meniscus, the ligaments that hold the knee together, possibly some muscle attachments if those are breaking down. So it's, it's usually, you know, anywhere from 15-plus injections to different um, <clears throat> kind of micro-injections, different areas that are kind of breaking down around that joint. So it's, it's more than just a single shot, but it's, it's relatively invasive when you, you know, compare it to other things they could have done. As far as the recovery time, uh, it's probably going to vary depending on which procedure you choose to have. <laughs> what, what, what on average uh, should someone expect as far as recovery time? Yeah, so recovery time is relatively, I would say, active. You don't want to do too much passive. You want to kind of get people moving sooner than later. Um, so I really have a bunch of protocols for all the different joints, and in general, it's going to be about a week of relative downtime. That means you're not going to be lifting over five pounds. You're not going to be doing a lot of ballistic running or jumping. You want to let that tissue that's trying to heal have a chance to get caught up a little bit. So we take about a week of just kind of downtime, just you know, chilling out, getting caught up on Netflix, watching some movies, and then the second week you'll you'll start some active physical therapy to start working on range of motion, to strengthen around the area. Third week, a little bit more. Fourth week, you're almost back into activity. Fifth week, you're starting to advance, getting more athletic again. So, um, But you do have a little bit of relative downtime because you really want to protect that area while it's vulnerable after the procedure and then start to rehab it pretty quickly to get you back into action. Dr. B, if people do want to go and uh, take a look at this for themselves, what is the procedure? What should they do if they want to contact Rejuve about working on their arthritis issues? Yeah, I mean, definitely you know, go to our website, rejuvemedical.com, or... If you want to come in and see one of us here, um, have an appointment, you know, just talk through it or get a, an accurate diagnosis of what's causing your pain, you can always call us at 320-271-8480. So definitely uh, love to talk to people and, and, and spread this, this new information out there. Excellent. Joel, thanks for your time. As always, great information. You're welcome. We'll talk to you soon. That's Dr. Joel Baumgartner, Rejuve Medical, joining us here on Health Matters and WJON. We return next week at this time.